This tutorial will take a look at the 10 most negative and the 10 most positive features of investing in property. OK, so let's start by performing a quick reality check and look at the negative features relating to property investment. First of all, the investment is not liquid, unlike stocks and shares, which can be offloaded virtually instantly. One of the questions I always ask my students is, how many properties could you buy with an unlimited budget between 10 and 12 in the morning at an exhibition such as Home Buyers or the Property Investor Show? The answer, of course, is millions of pounds worth. It really is just a question of how fast you can sign the paperwork. My next question is, how many of those properties could you sell between midday and five minutes past the hour? The arts is probably or definitely zero. Compare this with stocks and shares. Once again, you could buy millions of pounds worth between 10 and 12. In fact, you wouldn't even need the two hours. But you could sell the whole lot by 12.05. And really, the same goes for fine wines, classic cars and most other forms of investment. There is almost always somebody who will buy the other investments from you instantly, but the quickest you can rely on getting your money back from your property investment is around two months, and that assumes that you use an auction to sell your property, in which case you are unlikely to get top dollar. The second negative is that the investment has to be created. Stocks and shares, fine wines, classic cars or antiques have all been created by someone else and over time have become investments and ownership of the investment can be transferred to you today along with the benefits. If the shares rise in value tomorrow, you own the gain. Whilst it is possible to buy a property that is already let, these properties represent a very small percentage of the properties bought for investment. Therefore, as an investor, you have to go out and create the investment. You have to find the property, possibly refurbish it, and then let it before you can classify it as an investment. The third negative is that the actual cash cost of the investment is not easily calculated in advance, that is, before you have committed yourself to buying, regardless of whether you are buying to let or buying to flip, and this can impact on the performance of the investment. Virtually every other asset class is straightforward. You will have the actual cost of the investment, plus relatively minor acquisition costs, and of course, you can't fix up a stock, share or fine wine although you can restore a classic car or antique furniture. In almost every case, you will pay cash for the investment. The vast majority of property investors use borrowed money to buy a property or, at the very least if letting, will borrow against any increased value once any renovation work is complete. The more extensive the renovation, the higher the probability of getting the numbers wrong, which is why it's difficult to calculate accurately the actual cost in advance the same can apply to restoring classic cars or antiques. But in the case of property, there's always the possibility that the property or the rent is downvalued for mortgage purposes, whether a buy-to-let or buy-to-flip, which will impact on the amount that you or your buyer can borrow. As a result, your cash cost will increase if letting or your sale price will decrease if selling. I know an investor who forgot to include in his cash calculations stamp duty on a £400,000 block of flats. Ouch! The next negative aspect is that if letting, the ongoing costs and returns can vary substantially, primarily due to letting voids. These are periods where the property is empty between tenants, and this scenario can't apply to the other forms of investment that I have mentioned. Most investors will build a number of void days or weeks into their calculations, but that number is very much open to debate, and the void period can range from two days to two months in a year. Two days is probably a little tight, whereas two months is probably excessive. Investors often make the mistake of reducing the rent received by the amount of the void so that if they were working on a two-week void period during a year, they will reduce the rental income by two weeks. They forget, however, that they will incur costs during that two-week void, possibly including council tax and utility standing charges. 
Assuming that investors remember to include 12 months of mortgage payments in their calculations, voids can still turn a potential monthly profit into a big loss. Again, voids are a unique feature to property investment. They don't occur in any other asset class, and most assets don't have ongoing costs, with the possible exception of insurance on fine wines, classic cars, and antiques. My negative point number five is that truly independent advice is difficult to obtain. It's pretty easy to get advice on stocks and shares, even on niche markets such as Brazilian coffee or Trinidad sugar, regardless of where you are based in the world. Google either and you will find a wealth of information. Likewise, independent advice is readily available if you are considering investing in cars, wines or antiques. Again, you can start with Google. But trying to find someone who can advise you on where or what to invest in when it comes to property is almost impossible. Googling Letting Advice UK, for example, results in a little other than general information. No single person or organisation has all the knowledge needed. It is even difficult to get independent advice on what to invest in, having decided on the where. Most investors in a location are only knowledgeable about their own niche market. For example, I can give you reams of advice on letting to professional shares in Battersea, West London, because that is one of my niche markets. But if you ask me about students or housing benefit tenants in Battersea, I can only give you my general thoughts and ideas. The same is true for professionals, such as letting agents. If they specialise in letting to students, they will recommend that strategy. But if they don't let to students, that particular letting agency will generally criticise that strategy and try and persuade you to adopt a different strategy that they do specialise in. The same applies to flipping. If the agent doesn't list ex-local authority property, and some don't, they would probably say that there is no demand locally for that type of property. I remember that Foxtons adopted that attitude in their Clapham branch where I started buying properties in that location. There was no demand. They changed their policy after ex-local authority or ELA prices had increased by about 20%. The truth of the matter was that they weren't prepared to list properties at the cheaper end of the market but weren't prepared to admit it. The sixth feature in this list may surprise you. It's very difficult to obtain information on local property prices, yields and tenant or buyer demand from one single source. You can find an indication of value and rent on right move, for example, but missing from the equation is the tenant or buyer demand. Who wants to rent at the location and what percentage does this niche tenant represent of the whole? Is there a good demand from potential buyers and who are they? Mouse Price and Zoopla come close, but neither drills down past the first part of a postcode or identifies niches like HMO or Housing Benefit Tenants, or first-time buyers in the case of flips. Also, you can't visit a multi-branch estate agency, sit down and talk to one of their staff about your investment strategy if any aspect is out of sync with the local market. For example, you may live in a location where terraced houses cost £100,000, but are wanting to discuss the viability of investing in terraced houses costing £50,000. In that case, you have to go to a branch or branches that sell terraced houses for £50,000, and the branch you're sitting in may not even know which of their branches you should visit. It's difficult, if not impossible, to find out which are the locations throughout the UK where the average price of a terraced house is £50,000. Then try and add in another very important ingredient, the rent or yield. For example, you want a list of all the locations in the UK where you can buy a terraced house, or even any type of house, for £50,000, which would let for at least £4,000 a year, giving an 8% yield to support a 5% rate of interest on a 75% loan to value. It's impossible to get that far, so you can forget about introducing the next ingredient, tenant or buyer demand. And yet here you are wanting to invest tens, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds for the benefit of the UK rented and owner-occupier housing market. To make the right strategic decisions, you will need to uncover all this information as you carry out your due diligence on the location and neighbourhoods that you want to invest in.
But to start with, you have to virtually stick a pin in a map to identify a location and then check to see if it fits your criteria. My last negative point, property investment involves debt. A vital net investment involves accruing a very high level of debt, whilst flipping can still involve debt and you will always have to consider vital let as a fallback position if the market moves against you. Back in 2002, I bought a masonet in Battersea with the intention of flipping. I put the property under offer in the March and for various reasons didn't reach completion until late October. The property needed about four weeks' work to fix up for sale, which would bring this property onto the market just before Christmas, which is not a good time to sell. The question was, would the market continue to be on an upward trend in the following spring, enabling me to sit tight for three to six months before completion of the resale? I doubted it, and because I always made sure that all the properties I bought were lettable, I let this property quickly and easily. In the event, the market did steam ahead again the following spring, so I'd got that call wrong, because it would take me at least six to nine months now to get vacant possession if I wanted to carry on and sell. Now, of course, you can buy a property with cash and not borrow a penny, but as I will demonstrate throughout this course, not borrowing will detrimentally impact on the performance of your investment but you must be completely comfortable with the level of debt, so never feel pressured into borrowing more money than you and your partner, if you have one, are comfortable with. Now I'm going to move on to the advantages of property investment, and where there is a negative, there is always a positive. You will be pleased to hear that there are more positives than negatives, so let's look at why property investment is the best deal in town. Having finished off the list of negatives with effectively a health warning on borrowing, my first positive feature is that you can borrow a substantial part of your initial investment, which makes property investment unique when compared with other forms of investment. And to make the decision to borrow more attractive, the more that you borrow as a percentage of the value of the property, the greater the return on your cash. The second positive point is that loans up to 75% LTV are currently available for buy-to-let with a slightly lower percentage for flips and the number of available loans is currently increasing on almost a daily basis. Pre-2008 credit crunch time, LTVs maxed out at 85% with the occasional 90% but since you were able to add arrangement fees and other costs into your loan, you were generally able to borrow between 85 and 90% of the property value. I don't think it will be long before 85% loans for investment purposes are back again, readily available but at a cost. The third positive is that you can borrow 100% for second and subsequent purchases. The way this works is that as property values increase, and they will again in the future, you can borrow against the increased equity in the properties that you own by remortgaging or applying for a further advance and marry that loan to a mortgage on a new property that you want to buy. The result is that 100% of the cost of the new property is borrowed money. This again makes property investment different. Try using your shares as collateral for a loan to buy more shares. The fourth positive, you can buy, refit and furnish with cash or a short-term loan and then remortgage to release all your cash or maybe even more cash than you initially invested. A forced appreciation or added value strategy allows you to borrow against an increased value that you have created rather than be dependent on market-driven growth. And to finish off the positive points about borrowing, there are a wide variety of loans available, such as repayment mortgages, where each month your payment includes an element of the capital sum you originally borrowed. Interest-only mortgages, where you only pay the interest on the capital sum until the end of the mortgage, when the capital sum is then due for repayment. Flexible or current account mortgages, where you only pay interest on the daily debit balance, again until the end of the mortgage. Daily balances can rise and fall, particularly if you pay your rents into the account. Also, there is short-term bridging finance available, which is generally targeted at the renovator or developer, plus cash-rich, time-poor investors who may be interested in a joint venture. 
All of this is covered in the Mortgage Maze tutorial. Number six on my list. Aside from the lenders, there are specialist suppliers with products and services that are both fit for the purpose and designed for the investment market. Since the Buy-to-Let initiative was launched by Arla in 1996, followed by a plethora of property investment-related TV programs, every other person has become a budding Buy-to-Letter or DIY developer and specialist products and services have proliferated, which include insurance schemes, maintenance and repair services, furniture and furnishings specifically designed for the rental properties, plus most building material superstores have extensive libraries on every aspect of renovating a house for the DIY developer. All you need to do is to visit a few property exhibitions and you will find a vast number of companies exhibiting goods and services aimed at both the buy-to-let and buy-to-flip investor or simply Google your problem. The next one. Property price increases have historically tracked incomes, which means that over the long term, as a buy-to-let investor, you can expect, in fact I'd say you can rely on, property prices increasing. Therefore, the value of your portfolio will increase because, over time, incomes will increase, enabling us to enjoy a better or higher standard of living. Another point to make about property values is that your property cannot go bust, unlike a company in which you can buy shares. Your property business can go bust, but the property itself can't go bust. And provided that you have your property properly and comprehensively insured, it doesn't matter if it blows up, burns down, or falls into a big black hole. Your money is still safe. Another positive feature of property investment is that the volatility of property prices is around 14% as against about 40% for stocks and shares. And this takes into account the recent credit crunch and the fall in property values. Stocks and shares can bounce about wildly, and often do, and whilst property prices obviously vary, and sometimes considerably, variations tend to be much slower by comparison. Just as property prices have historically tracked incomes, so do rents. This means that over time you can expect your rents to increase and therefore your investment will become more profitable in real terms, particularly if you have fixed rate mortgages. Provided incomes increase at a rate greater than inflation, which is what every working person wants and expects, your rental income will increase in real terms. Another point to make is that rents are free of government control. You will remember from the history tutorial that I talked about fair rents and how they dissuaded investors in the past. You will therefore understand how important it is that new rents are now free to follow the market. Last but not least, the rented property market is growing. In fact, in the short term, there is a shortage of rented housing, which can only be beneficial for the prepared buy to let investor. According to government figures released at the turn of the century, some 250,000 new rental properties were required each year until 2016, and that was before the credit crunch and the increase in demand for rented properties. Savile's research reported that as a result of natural wastage, approximately 125,000 properties were sold out of the private rented sector each year. The government also recommended that the PRS should increase by 125,000 properties each year to meet the expected increase in demand. Adding both figures together gives you a total of 250,000 new properties needed each year and that annual target or aim has not been reached since it was set in 2004. The private rental sector has grown by around 1 million properties since 2005 which is an average of 150,000 properties a year and this growth rate has slowed down considerably since the credit crunch. So, there are plenty of opportunities for you to generate real wealth in the current market. That brings me to the end of the negative and positive features of property investment. I hope you feel that your time has been well spent. The Property Investors Building Blocks explains how to mitigate the risks I've outlined in the negative features and shows you how to take advantage of the positive features I've also listed. This is David Humphreys signing off. I trust that you will rejoin me for the foundation set of tutorials.